you mentioned Schopenhauer, which is excellent. Um, I feel like the idea of nothing more fundamental than the will, the inner nature of everything. I love that one. I love the one eye of the world that looks out from every creature. I love that one as well. So, you know, given, given the case of Schopenhauer and yourself, I mean, we now have significantly more than a hundred years ago had, especially thousands of years ago, if we're talking like the Vedic Rishis and stuff, we have significantly more access, um, especially under our revelation of quantum mechanics and whatnot. It's just giving us more and more access to what we believe is that nature of reality. So let's talk about this. You've written about this quite a bit now. I find this subject to be um, really deeply interrelated between um, consciousness and physics in the sense that this is about um, the bottom up panpsychism and cosmopsychism that's, that's, a, that's occurring. A fundamental consciousness as a universe wide field. And that um, is, is, would it, would it be fair to say that there's a, there's some sort of an abstract mathematics that are happening, you know, infinitely far away and that it's emerging, it's emerging an illusory holographic space time. I think well, just, just on no, no. a, point of terminology, uh, yes. you, you alluded to bottom-up panpsychism, but you really meant cosmopsychism. Uh, bottom-up okay. panpsychism, also called constitutive panpsychism, what they would say is that every elementary subatomic particle is conscious, but there is no universal consciousness. There are only gazillions of little tiny microscopic uh, consciousnesses. I think that's an untenable view. The only okay. tenable view is the opposite. There is only one cosmic subject and individual subjectivity is an illusion, uh, which is the view I subscribe to that would be a form of um, cosmopsychism. Okay. Now, the mathematics. Well, Alan, I think m mathematics is how we describe things. Um, the fact that mathematical truths, which are so intuitive to us, so intuitive that it's like, it's self-evident to us. It, it has to be true, right? Two plus two is four, almost by definition. And there are a number of much more subtle, nuanced math mathematical truths that we are absolutely sure are correct. And, and, and this psychological intuition happens to apply perfectly to the dynamics of the world out there. I mean, this in itself is extraordinary under materialistic uh, metaphysics because there is no reasoning principle why our axiomatic the rules of thought should be the rules according to which the world out there <laughs> evolves <laughs> and moves. Um, under idealism, uh, it's not a, a problem because it's a mind out there as well. Actually, it's the same mind and the division is, uh, the separation is an illusion. So uh, our axioms of thoughts, those rules of, of thought that we consider self-evident apply to the world because it's the same mind that is behind the world applying those same axiomatic rules of thinking. Um, but then we use this fact, this, this similarity between how, well, this equivalence between how we think and how the world behaves, we use it to our advantage to describe the behavior of the world according to these axioms of thought. And that's, that's what we call mathematics. We are describing the behavior uh, of the world. And what it, I think, ultimately informs us of is of how mind behaves. That's what mathematics is telling us. Uh, mind has some inherent patterns of behavior, which a Jungian would call uh, archetypes of behavior. Um, Jungians went as far as to say that um, the axioms of mathematics were archetypal in nature. Marie-Louise von Franz wrote a book, I think in 1974, I think it's called A Number and Time, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure anymore about the title, but they explore this notion to which I subscribe. The archetypes of mind are the, um, how to say... The, like they're the, the no fundamental source codes? 
that's one way to put it. Another way to put it would be to use a vibration analogy. You know, um, when you pluck a guitar string, it vibrates according to one of its normal modes of vibration. It plays certain notes, but not other. And that note depends on how long the string is, the elasticity of the string. Mm -hmm. So mind has its normal modes of excitation. Once mind gets excited, it gets excited in certain ways and not in others. Mm -hmm. So there are these archetypal uh, uh, um, fundamental modes of behavior uh, in mind. And I think mathematics, uh, by giving people direct inner access to those templates, allows us to describe from the outside as well how the world behaves. And it gives us profound hints to what mind is and how it comports itself. Interesting. So there, to, so it's more accurate to say a bottom-up panpsychism, given what cosmopsychism currently describes itself as. But if or you could say it more accurate, that I would say top-down panpsychism. Is a top-down panpsychism. Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. From from mind. From from a universal mind from a to universal individual mind, mind okay. as opposed to to from microscopic minds to us. To, uh, okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Interesting. So a top-down panpsychism from universal mind to us, and but there there's a there is some interesting. So the the feedback sort of function isn't necessarily from an a, a, like an abstract mathematics that are happening beyond the like quantum field level, and then and they're going through this process of the uh, unfolding and enfolding, as like David oh, Bohm I would think. say. But but it could or from this universal. Uh, consciousness level or this infinite consciousness level. So it could, you, you, the idea is that it could be doing the un, the unfolding and folding from an, the, the, those seem like the same no, I, thing to me as well, this, the, in that macro micro sense. That's I, why, I how you, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I see how you're visualizing it because the okay. laws of quantum mechanics are microscopic laws. You're thinking in terms of uh, uh, the bottom up. Um, I understand that. Um, I think the way to visualize space um, is, is misleading um, wh when you go down that path. The laws of quantum mechanics apply to all space, everywhere. Yeah. These are fundamental laws. Um, in modern physics, we even don't talk anymore about literal particles. We talk about excitations of a field. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> particles are little ripples on a field, They're like ripples in water. There is nothing to the ripple but the water. In the same way, there's nothing to a particle but this field. Um, today, we still didn't manage to reconcile the different quantum fields. So we still talk about a set of them. But there is a very strong intuition in physics that uh, they are actually all facets of one field. Um, and this one field is not spatially bound. It doesn't yeah. have a size. It, 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 it is the entire universe. I, I, I was about to say it's in, it encompasses the entire universe. It, it is the entire universe. Um, and the laws apply to this spatially unbound field. So even if you talk about microscopic laws, we, a term that we use because we are not able to separate uh, and bring these laws into focus on micro macroscopic objects. They are hidden behind their own interactions. Uh, so to yeah. see them, we need to look at a microscop microscopic system. But, but this is an artifact of our ability to detect something. That something in itself is not microscopic. Mm. It is the behavior, the templates of movement or vibration, the archetypes of a spatially unbound quantum field, which is the universe. The laws of quantum mechanics are not even local. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. uh, um, when you talk about microscopic laws, we are just saying that we can't discern these laws unless we look at very tiny things. It doesn't mean that the laws are only in the tiny things. No, they are in front of you right now. They are making this screen in front of you uh, okay. be able to exist and, and do what it does. It's just that we can't discern them at the macroscopic level, but the laws are not microscopic. They are universal. Yeah. Okay. This is a very interesting. So like, a, like an implicate or like a source code or an infinite consciousness or cosmic consciousness that it would, it, it pervades absolutely everything always. And that it's not, um, but this this part of it's this part of it's interesting. You you mentioned this. Um, 
there is a sort of potentially power law of the most common um, um, abstract mathematics, re the relationships that are going on, and that those most common relationships emerge in the holographic illusory space-time as the most common archetypes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, okay, now, now you hinted at uh, one of the most difficult topics in science and philosophy today. Um, we do not have consensus about how the laws of quantum mechanics, um, which we discern at a microscopic level, how they somehow give rise to the classical laws of physics, like Maxwell equations, Newton's equations. Why do these equations ap approximate so well the behavior of, of the world we see? And how do they emerge from a purely probabilistic uh, uh, framework, which, which is what seems to apply at the most fundamental level? Now, I'm, I'm on purpose avoiding the word microscopic. I'll talk about the most fundamental level. How does the orderliness of macro macroscopic laws arise or emerge out of the probabilistic behavior of nature at, at, at its most fundamental levels? We do not have a clear answer to that. There are many attempted answers. Uh, I'm right now reading an excellent paper by a member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, the leader of a, a quantum physics group in the University of Vienna, which I think is one of the most promising uh, avenues of investigation now. You have uh, cubism, which is another attempt to make sense of this. Um, but it's an open question. Somehow, that probabilistic behavior at the most fundamental level preferentially leads to the emergence of uh, recognizable regularities, which yeah. we call uh, laws of nature. And then that leads us into recognizable phenomenological states. So then right. there's that relationship. So, so in a sense, we can say that there are specific, there's a feedback mechanism that occurs where the more that I, as my illusory individual, become more causeless joy and imperturbable peace, the more that I become that, the more that I cause a feedback loop to this source code that then makes the abstract mathematical relationships more in the emergent direction of that causeless peace, causeless joy and imperturbable peace. We do not know if and how these feedback mechanisms work. We haven't been able to, to model them. But I think it would be extraordinarily implausible to say that uh, the direction of influences here uh, is only in one way, points only in one way. Uh, I think it's extraordinarily implausible. I think it's uh, almost a virtual certainty that there are uh, feedback mechanisms uh, in operation here as well. Because we've known from complexity sciences, for instance, that it is feedback mechanisms that give rise to complexity. And boy, is this world complex. So uh, there, there should be feedback mechanisms, mechanisms operating at every level here, including endogenous ex experiential states uh, um, that, that, that are providing feedback mechanisms in a way that uh, we, we haven't been, been able to model and discern clearly yet. And we could say that then that feedback is potentially the idea of the co-creators, that we are these, we have a co-creative relationship with reality. This is an extreme extraordinarily sensitive topic. <laughs> so uh, it, it's so easy to be misunderstood, uh, yeah. to be misunderstood when you talk about this. So bear with me. Um, there is an approach in physics, a very conservative, very level headed, um, I would say unassailable approach for interpreting quantum mechanics. I would say it's not even an interpretation. It's an acknowledgement of what quantum mechanics is saying which is called relational quantum mechanics by an Italian physicist called Carlo Rovelli, who has written a number of very good books. Um, and what Rovelli says is that uh, 
you know, if you bite the bullet of quantum mechanics from experiments, then there is no physical quantity, no physical entity that's absolute. They're all relative. Everything that's physical is relative to, to an observer, is relative to a point of measurement, uh, which then immediately raises the question, well, if everything physical is relative, then is it relative to what? <laughs> Whatever it's relative to, it can't be physical. Otherwise, you get into infinite regress, right? So um, if you understand this, you will immediately come to the conclusion that what is really out there is not physical. It is mental. And physicality is relative to mentality. Yeah. Um, and that's how physicality arrives, from an interaction between two segments of mind, at least two. Um, Physicality so, is relative to mentality. That's what quantum mechanics seems to be suggesting. I mean, the mentality part I added because I think it's inevitable. It's the only other thing we know of next <laughs> to physicality. Uh, but quantum mechanics seems to be telling us quite unambiguously, especially after a superb experiment in 2018 that sort of closed all loopholes, that physicality is relative. But then relative to what? I would say it's relative to mentality. So in so far as each person is a observer, a different observer with a unique perspective, then your physical world is fundamentally different from my physical world because my physical world is relative to me and I'm taking a different perspective. So we all inhabit different physical worlds and your <laughs> physical world, and bear with me, the, don't misunderstand me yet. I, I have to complete this thought. So, um, of course, we co-create our physical world because it's relative. It arises from an interaction between our personal dissociated mentation and the transpersonal mental states out there. It is from that interaction that our physical world is created. So we co-create it. We are half of the equation. However, we describe our respective physical worlds in mutually consistent manners. You also would say, well, there is a moon at night, there are stars, there are trees, there are cars, you know what I mean? Um, so the other part of the equation seems to be transpersonal mental states in which we are all immersed. Can we change that? I would say all indications are that, are that we can't because otherwise I would just conjure up the world to be much better than it is now. And I seem to be unable to do that. I don't seem to be able to create my own reality fully. And I understand that that's not what we are claiming either. You're not saying that we all create our own reality. You're saying that there is some degree of influence. So I would say there's a massive degree of influence as far as the physicality that surrounds you is concerned. But what ensures that your physical world is consistent with mine and with everybody else's is this transpersonal ocean of mentation that is out there. And then can we as individuals influence that ocean of transpersonal mentation? I personally think very little, if at all. Some of the greatest minds of all time have influenced that and made everything much better. I, I, I am open to that idea. But then you could say, well, uh, I influence the world in trivial ways. Like um, if I use my arms and I move a rock, I've influenced the world. But what you mean is, is something deeper than that. I mean, mean I mean Michelangelo, you know. That, that's, yeah, okay, that, yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> so I'll go along with that. But that's not what we mean, right? What we mean is, can your inner attitude yeah, influence yeah. the physical world through non-physical means? In other words, not through the use of perception and everything that correlates with perception. Can a thought, can a inner feeling influence something yeah. non-locally? Perhaps uh, there is some evidence that this could be the case uh, arising from research on so-called psi phenomena, for instance, at the University of Virginia in the US. Um, but I, I'm tempted to think that that influence is rather limited. Let me give you another example on that is even something as simple as like if we have the spectrum from, you know, Michelangelo to something very simple, it can be something along the lines of when you are with another person, especially if it's a, a family member or a friend, um, the idea is that everything is inextricably connected in this knot of life and that if one has that equanimity that 
immovable peace that causes us joy just by that simple phenomenological state can significantly affect what the other person's experience is. And so that slowly, in a sense, um, it, it takes the suffering out of the knot of life. How is that? How does it take the suffering out? Because by your phenomenological state being that causes joy and imperturbable peace, it butterfly effects to the other per oh. yeah, in that in that knot of life. All of a sudden the other person feels your peace and then they themselves also take the notch down. And we all know of the scenario where you if you go a notch up they go a notch up and it just versus bringing it so you slowly work out the misery and the suffering and the needless um replaying of the worst possible uh archetypal uh phenomenologies yeah i i this this section has been super super interesting um in this last bit is it is it possible to say that the like there is wherever everywhere is this source code implicate cosmic consciousness infinite yeah, consciousness it's non-spatial so non-spatial everywhere god. or nowhere yeah yeah yes okay so we have this non-spatial um god it's everywhere um yeah or nowhere so so now this idea that from this source code implicate etc from there we we have a we have a, a we have a power law of the abstract mathematical possibilities that exist and then from there it's possible that there is the emergence of phenomenological states and that we have a direct feedback potentially influence on that that on those abstract mathematical states by in in a sense we can drive the knot of life anywhere from a simple relationship making it better to being like a michelangelo or an elon musk and trying to drive some sort of massive artistic or technological revolutionary change to better the world well look um I think what you're hinting at is, is our, does our influence extend beyond the visual or perceptual cues that we provide? I mean, you, you, have that, you had that example where, uh, of um, a discussion that escalates. Um, you could say, well, it escalates because each participant is providing obvious visual cues to the other. He's speaking louder, his eyes are going wide open, he's gesticulating more. Um, but what you're hinting at, if I understand you, is that beyond the perceptual cues, beyond your physical action in the world. There is a direct influence between your inner states and the inner states of other people, and maybe the inner states of the universe at large. It, it's beyond the visual cues. Um, so that's correct. I see you're nodding, so that, that you, my interpretation and is And you correct. called that a transpersonal ocean? Well, um, insofar as there is a direct influence between you and something outside you, it's going through a transpersonal field of yeah, some field sort. ocean some yeah sort. i like yeah. that yeah yeah the yeah. drop in the ocean analogy yeah is. an ocean a few yeah. these are all metaphors yeah. anyway yeah. But yeah. You, you get my meaning um can that be happening i think it can it's a personal opinion uh, i think people who deny that that's happening um are in a position to deny it because usually that happens together with all the visual cues and, and, and physical effects that we produce just by being in the world. We dis, you know, just by existing, we displace air. We occupy a certain volume in yeah. space. So because these things always go together, the so-called trivial influences, which are visual perceptual cues and your physical presence in the world, and the direct, more subtle influences, it's very hard to tease them apart so we can categorically say that there are these more subtle influences as well, as well. That's why it's so difficult to categorically say, yes, they exist, because it's difficult to tease them apart from all the other things that are happening. Uh, I think there is some research indicating that these subtle influences uh, do occur. Um, 
but they are not massive because if they were massive, I mean, give you an example. If, uh, if I knew that war is about to happen, I would immediately sit, meditate, concentrate and stop it from happening. But I can't do that. I can't stop world hunger. hunger. I, can't, I can't stop the devastation of the environment that is happening around the world today. I can't stop people from getting sick. I can't stop my loved ones from dying from cancer and heart attacks. So uh, somehow the so-called physical way of influencing, which does not entail a direct uh, inner connection, uh, but just your action in the space-time framework that we call the physical world, those seem to be overwhelming in relation to the more subtle uh, channels for, for influencing things. I think it's just an observation. It's not even an opinion. It's an observation. Um, and that's what makes it difficult to categorically pin down this other thing that might be going on. And the thing is, if it is going on, then it opens up a whole lot of other degrees of freedom. Yeah. Uh, so it's important to know whether they are actually going on or not. It, 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 it's, it almost seems like a, a fool's errand to try and say that it doesn't go on in the sense that if, if, if the, the, even the, the simple, beautiful, imaginative idea of a rock star electric car company that you know, may take two decades to actually get into um, solid production worldwide um, does end up that started just as that an imaginative idea now is able to distribute tens of thousands and more of these um, of the, what would what one could call the top quality electric um, vehicle across across the planet, which then somebody else does in a sense exchange that value of of money you know, for the, the vehicle. And so then they themselves, uh, they've basically taken what was an, an imagined, imagined, imagined idea that they themselves are now purchasing. And now it's in there as even yeah. a, something that they use every day. Um, and so, yeah. And, and that same thing is true about basically everything. And Steve Jobs was one of the ones that said that, you know, these devices, the phones and computers and, and, but everything else as well, were literally imagined by people and executed by people that are just like you. And so that's why the idea is, you know, there is of course a bell curve and there are people that are extremely conscientious um, and that are that can abstractly reason and that have emotional intelligence to work with teams and stuff like that versus other people that don't, but there's all these mixes in between. And, and so it, people have the possibility to make things even incrementally better, even at that, at that personal level. 